exciting new project or, or continuation of a very exciting previous project, but linking it to Gatekeeper. And uh, that is the Wheel of Life project. Peter Dawkins. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I'm finding it quite difficult sending. I'm, I'm so moved by everything that's happened today. I found it so moving, so thrilling, very exciting, and great hope for the future, isn't it? I mean, it's, but thank you. Thank you, everyone who's contributed. Um, so I want to share a new project for, uh, for Gatekeeper Trust Skin Do, but actually it's a very old project. Um, old in terms of what we've been working with for a long time, but old in terms of, well, I don't know, 3,000 years or something like that. And um, it's, it's all about what we call a wheel of life. It, and another name for that is zodiac. Zodiac means wheel of life. Uh, chakra means wheel of life. It's the same thing. Chakra, zodiac, wheel of life. It's a fundamental form, an archetypal form of the universe. It's based on the idea of the centre and the circle, the radiation of energy through it, and the various ge geometric shapes that are produced, and then on that, other things then, then form. In three dimensions, of course, it's um, a, a sphere. And then within that, I've seen, um, and I see it in, in each person as well, within that sphere of light, which is based on love, a love energy, um, there is a circulation of energy that I've, I've always called a fountain. But um, this morning I've um, now learned it can be called a torus. <laughs> um, it's a fundamental energy <coughs> form of the universe. It's like the Holy Spirit, the energy moving within the basic life form, um, the, the um, spiritual form of the sphere. And, um, and if you cut, imagine cutting through that sphere... Um, you get you get the circle, the circle in three dimensions, if you like, that, that chakra that exists. So chakra is, you could say chakra is actually a sphere, not just a circle on the ground or something like that. It's a very, it's common, it's common everywhere. We've all got it. Every, every form of life has got it. The planet's got it. Um, and also various uh, forms in the landscape have got it. Um, as, you, as many of you know, I've, I've seen angels since I was very young, and that's sort of developed, and they've been teachers for me. And, um, and at one time, years ago, I suddenly began seeing landscape angels, a particular type of angel. And they are in the landscape, and they, they stand, and they are literally these fountains of life, producing the great wings, we call them wings, angelic wings, but they, they are energy flows. Um, that stretch over the land, and they're like in charge. They're the thought form, the divine thought form of that particular area of landscape. Um, in ourselves, we, we are our higher selves. I like it like those angels. It, you know, deep within our outer personality, inside us is our angel. And you know, if you get to see it, it is this great fountain of energy. The more love we have, the more energized it it is, and the brighter it becomes. If, if you lose your love, it kind of goes rather shadowy, and, um, but it's still there. We still have it. Um, well, I want to introduce you to one I've been working with for a long time. It's um, energy form right over, covering the whole of Britain in terms of Roman Britain, England and Wales. There's also one over Ireland, also one over Scotland. You can see a map of that up there. And where the wings of the angel, the, the current of energy... The fountain falls to the ground. It makes these great circles around, which you can draw geometrically like that. That's the other fantastic thing about the universe. It's, it's fundamentally geometry, you know, but geometry in motion. Um, so, well, I get excited about that because I used to be an architect, so <laughs> you know, I, I can read, read that language. But that gives you an idea. It's, it's, I mean, this has taken years of research, really, and, and proving it and testing it out, but um, the centre of those circles are actually on the, what the ancient Celts, about 3,000 years ago, maybe longer ago than that, these were recognised as the most powerful geomantic spots in these three, three areas that we can call the three countries now. And um, 
they're the sacred centres associated royalty with ki keeping the sacred flower, fire burning, and so on like that. And the extraordinary thing is they, they're connected in this triangle that's an equilateral triangle, which, which I think is quite unusual. I haven't found a similar arrangement elsewhere in the world. There might be, but I haven't found it. But it has its own story. And, and so these are known as the British Isles. The, the ancient Celts, who were known as the Brit Brythonic race, spoke Brythonic language, they inhabited all this land at one time, hence it got its name, its ancient name. Then other uh, uh, Celtic tribes came in and, and started to change it, and then, of course, the big invasions of the Angles and Saxons and Romans and so on. Um, but essentially, it's one land, one great land, that's, at all, that's a trinity, so it produces three distinct um, uh, nations, if you like. They, they are distinct. We're all distinct. The... the those in the England and Wales, the, the, which I'm calling the, the, the remainder of the British at the moment. <laughs> They're not really, but I, I can't think of another decent word for that to, to take on England and Wales. Um, that's distinct from Scotland, that's distinct from Ireland. You go and live in there and you start to take on the characteristics of it. The land tells you. you know, there's an old saying that a conqueror moving into a country becomes the conquered because they become indigenous to that land. The land speaks to them and changes them, even changes the way they speak, the way they behave, and so on like that. Um, so, you know, it's not surprising we've got, got the difference between the nations, the, 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 the English and Welsh and the um, Scots and the, and the, and the Irish. Anyway, what I want to focus on today is the British zodiac covers England, England and Wales because it's particularly important to us as the, uh, what we're doing as our work, a gatekeeper trust. Um, so if you can imagine at High Cross, the centre of, of this Roman Britain area, um, High Cross is the centre of this vast angel covering the whole of Britain and um, it really is there. And it's like a great column of light. When you approach High Cross, you just see this great column of light soaring up, which actually is flowing energy at the same time. And it's, it's or it stretches right, right across Britain. And within it creates um, a zodiac pattern. Now, the Celts, I think, must have been the first to lay it out, or maybe it was started earlier. But uh, there's certainly um, a tradition that was recorded and passed on by the bards and so on as to how it was laid out. And then they started laying out roads and, um, to mark it and other things like that. And th this, is, this, this is the original Merlin's Round Table, the dowry that was given to Guinevere um, so that when Arthur married Guinevere, he could be king of the country because Guinevere represented the land. The land is her dowry. Guinevere means the, the white lady, um, or in fact, the, the, the more ancient interpretation is, is the white serpent, the, you know, the flowing energy of, of the land and, and, and what's within us. Um, Guinevere. So, so the lady, the human lady, represents the land itself. And the, the king, to become king of the land, has to promise to be a good husband to his lady, which means being a good husband to the land. You, you husband the land. You, you, you know, it's husbandry, it's been mentioned already. Um, so that, that's um, the round table. Now, I've, I've researched a long time, so I got a good idea of the pattern of it and so on. So what we're trying to do in Gatekeeper is um, get people excited about um, moving through this, this great zodiac, through the land, to help it fulfill its purpose. I've, I've found, you know, we've talked a lot about um, songs, stories, poetry and so on. And um, what, what, what happens, them? why, when you're doing, when you get in tune with the land, you get in tune with the elementals, get in tune with fairy beings, you get in tune with the angels of the land, there are small angels and bigger angels, um, get in tune with them and you start to then produce yourself the right, right thing to do in harmony with them. Um, it's brought, brought up earlier, you know, can we control the weather? Well, I don't believe one can control the weather. One can cooperate 
with the angels and the nature beings. And actually, I think that's what was being explained by Patrick. Um, anyway, I, I found that if you're in tune properly, you learn to do the right thing in the right place. It's, it's good for everyone. It's good for nature. It's good for human beings. You do the right thing in the right place, and the weather produces the right thing also. We, we've had so many amazing examples of this as you go along. And, um, and we've seen examples of how the landscape changes for the better. And also I found the other thing, what well, we found the other thing, it happens, it not only speaks to the nature beings when we're doing the right thing, giving songs and so on um, in the right places, it not just affects the elementals, nature beings, actually affects human beings, human thoughts. So we have seen colossal changes going on in certain places where we've done this sort of work, where, you know, we can go to a place, clean it up, because often places are polluted, cleaned up physically, psychologically, and so on, and, and visualise a better space for it, you know, a better future, and... Um, then we go away and work on something else. And then the sort of six months, year, two years later, suddenly, big notice, the people in that little town or community have suddenly got this grand idea and they've gone out and they've respected this place and they're making it into like a little mini paradise. You know, it, it happens. So whatever we do in this right way, doing the right thing in the right place at the right time, using your heart attunement, it produces miracles, even in the human race, not, not just amongst nature and, and so on. Um, it's actually very exciting. If enough of us can do this, um, uh, you know, we, we could create paradise on earth eventually. Um, and that, that's my, my great belief. The, the other thing that this was called in the past was the marriage, the haros um, gamos, the, the marriage between heaven and earth, bringing the two things together. Now, these, these patterns, these zodiacs, are in us. They're in nature. But they can also, they've can they also been perceived in the sky with the circuit of the sun making the ecliptic circle. And then you've got the Milky Way galaxy coming across it. The meridian of the Milky Way galaxy, where it crosses the ecliptic, give you the two fixed points on the, on the ecliptic. And then the whole geometry of the, that circle is then laid out from that and then the groups of stars the constellations are associated with that to give a story so we project the story into the sky a story that's in tune with life itself a story of moving through life going through initiation and so on and we remember it because it's in the sky <coughs> that's one way of really remembering this wonderful fundamental story a story that we're actually acting out on earth. As Shakespeare says, we're, we're actors on the stage, the stage of, of the world. And, um, and it's good to know, get to know the story and your part, the part we each have to play in it and learn to do it well and to be in the right place on the stage at the right time. You know, kind of, if you get that right, then things, things will go better. And the, the Celts worked this way. They saw this. Um, it was taken up by successive cultures. You know, the Romans, Romans knew it. They, they, they worked with it. The Normans, when they came in, they learned the secret of it. They used it in a rather different way to try to dominate the country because these places, certain places, affect human psyche. So it can be used for good purposes and for bad purposes. That's why it's mostly been trying to be kept secret knowledge. Um, because there are dangers in it. But, but there's enough wonderful good people nowadays that this knowledge can be shared very widely to get as many people as possible doing the right things in the right places and so on. Pilgrimage is a very, very powerful part of it. Um, moving from one sacred place to another. Um, <laughs> Sorry, running out of time. <laughs> the, um, you know, I've given you that as a simple idea And I've got that. That's the that's the unequal sign zodiac. Now, look, there, there are two. There's always a double truth. Um, tradition has 
always says there's a dub double truth. There's the ideal and then there's the real. Or the ideal and then there's the natural. And um, in the Renaissance, a lovely way of showing that, you, you, they, they used to do um, a framework for a picture, you know, a, a framework of something. And then through the framework, you had flowers and other things and other plants growing. So you get the idea, if you like, a framework with roses growing up it. So the framework represents the ideal world, uh, the geometry, if you like, and then the, the flowers and so on, plants growing up through it, is the free will the rest of us have to, to grow within that geometry or grow within the laws of the universe. So there's always the double truth, the, the real, uh, the ideal and the natural. And we live our lives like that. We have an ideal of what we want to do, and we do our best to get towards it. We've never... We never manifest that ideal, we, but we get as close to it as we can. If we walk, we never walk in a straight line. We always want to walk in a straight line, but actually we never do. We kind of go in a serpent way. None of us can walk in a straight line. It's kind of impossible um, to do. Well, almost impossible unless you're a tightrope walker. But um, it's, there's always the, the, these two truths. And so when it comes to the zodiac, you've got, um, if you divide it geometrically, you have the perfect geometry. Most people think of a zodiac of a, as a circle divided into 12 equal signs, 12 equal parts. Well, that's the ideal, the, the, but then there's the unequal sign one, which is associated with the sizes of the zodiac constellations themselves. And that's what was mostly worked with on the ground by the Celts and other cultures like that. So that's, the, that's what that shows there. But they also knew the ideals, so they had the, the perfect pattern as well. Um, and that, that's to show the zodiac creatures sort of outlined there and how it works. I mean, there's so much I could tell you about this. It's a, it's a wealth of knowledge. I've, I've got very involved with entering our, in our Western tradition, our, our particular tradition of, of wisdom. Um, through the Rosicrucian story and um, what was done in Elizabethan Jacobean times and uh, hold the whole Shakespeare story. And I know, you know, Shakespeare, Sweet Swan of Avon, was deliberately set up to be in the Cygnus area of, of, of this whole British Isles so that the, the song could be continually sung then, the stories, the mystical stories, acted out there all the time, pumping out this wonderful sound into the whole, whole of this British zodiac. It's like a gift. You know, when we do things like that, we're giving a gift, like symbolized by hanging a prayer on a tree. You, you're giving a gift, and it creates a thought form, beautiful thought form given to the angel. And if it's of love, if it's in tune with the purpose of the land, purpose of the angel, if it's in tune, the angel accepts it and gives it power, gives it power, and it starts to work out. And so this has been, been done for a few hundred years. There's the sweet swan of Avon in, in, in the landscape, Brit, landscape Zodak of Britain singing, singing this beautiful song. It's affected the whole world. The whole world is affected by this song um, based on the Shakespeare story. And that's just one, one of the examples I can give you of this. But there's, there's more as well. But the, the exciting thing is, is to... Well, the exciting thing to me, because I'm getting a bit old now, getting an older, being an older, seeing, seeing younger people, you know, come up and get, pick, pick up the torch, as it were, and carry it on and take it on to the next, next stage, the next levels of, of development. Um, and and still, there's still a bit of energy in some of us, old, us oldies, isn't there? So we can still do a bit more, too. <laughs> and... Um, and just, just get in tune with this land. You know, we could make wonderful pilgrimage routes across this land. We can dance in this land. Our friend Susie Straw, um, she wanted a project to do. I gave her the project of dancing, dancing the circle of this landscape, which she did. She did it for 12 years or something or more and got it going. Um, she danced in one of the zodiac signs one month of the year and then go on to the next sign for the next year. So she was doing the circle, a bit like when the gypsies came. They, took, they found out this ancient plan and they moved through it in that circular way <coughs> as well. They, they, they headed for the main, 
guess that that gives you the, where the uh, the gypsies went to, which were the main places where they could um, get jobs, sell their produce, um, and so on like that. But they moved through that land in a circular way, st stopping in one place um, each month, and so on. And they were called the gypsy switches. So they they worked the zodiac in that way, in tune in tune with the land, singing their songs and so on as they went from place to place around this landscape. And that sort of thing is still needed to be done. It's very very important if you work in a circular way, you spin the chakra, because this is a chakra. And when chakras spin, energetically, they start to shine with light, and then magic, magic starts to happen. Um, so to go in a circular route would be fantastic, but to go in any way through it along the ancient energy paths is a wonderful thing to do. So um, I'm hoping this will become a very, very big projects, singing, dancing, loving, praying, poetry, whatever you can think of, dream it up. Uh, we, we often do things that create a mystery story. You have a mystery story, story with all the main steps of initiation in it, complete story, that's a prayer in itself, doing, doing a story, doing a play in the right place at the right time. You know, it creates these beautiful thought forms given to the angel to, for the angel to bless the land with and raises consciousness everywhere and brings prosperity. Okay, I'm going to stop there, I think. <laughs> uh, I hope you'll be excited by it all. And I do thank everyone who's contributed to this this, this weekend. For me, I've, I've come like back from the dead from last year, and so for me it's like this is like a resurrection experience for me to be here for this conference, feeling pretty healthy, and <laughs> again, and able to speak loudly again, and to see you all shining away here. You're all shining. I can't help but see it. And um, one of the things happened to me in hospital last year uh, was a reminder, just, just don't keep myself so hidden. I tend to hide away and shine, but just, just to speak out and tell people what I see more. more. And, and you're great. You're all great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. Um, that is the love and enthusiasm that has that founded Gatekeeper and